So a few days ago, I was scrolling through TikTok and I came across girl dinner. Girl dinner is a new TikTok trend where women display their unconventional dinner preferences. Usually these meals, if you can call them that, are very easy to make. They tend to be meals that you would make for yourself, but probably not for someone else. But beyond that, there aren't really limits to girl dinner. Girl dinner can be 10 cans of corn. Girl dinner can be a stunning snack plate. Girl dinner can be ramen, mozzarella sticks and Cheetos. What unites all all of these girl dinner TikToks is that they show women joyfully consuming foods that they, as adults, shouldn't be eating for meals because they're unhealthy, because they're too easy, because they're not aesthetically pleasing enough, because they're frivolous, because they don't conform to a traditional dinner menu, because the portions are too big or in some cases too small. Although there are commentators who have argued that some of the videos under this sound align too closely with disordered eating for comfort, this isn't what's at the heart of this trend. Most of these videos speak to a deep desire that many women feel to celebrate a deviance from societal standards that they've been held to. For many, it's a reclamation of girlhood, when their food intake was policed by family members or they heard jeering cries of stay in the kitchen from the boys around them. In this way, it can be said there's something subversive about girl dinner. After all, girl dinner is about women not catering to anybody's taste but their own. They're easy to make, unimpressive, visually unappealing meals that prioritize individual female pleasure. And by sharing these individual pleasures with a playful TikTok sound, this trend destigmatizes a common behavior that might otherwise have been found shameful. But why was this framed as girl dinner and not woman dinner? And isn't the ability to have control over your food one of the joys of adulthood? There's been a rise in the mainstream use of girl as both an identity, but also as an activity marker in a way that hasn't really happened for men. Think about having a hot girl summer or trying to get the clean girl aesthetic or seeking out that girl inspo. As a term, girl has included young women for some time, but it feels like it's now picking up speed because people online have worked out that it's a useful branding tool to invent a new kind of girl every week. With each girl comes a new aesthetic, a new makeup trend, a new skincare routine that often focuses on preserving youth in some way. You can see this too in the way many people use girl or girly in a kind of Elle Woods type way. It's like this playful pink feminine power. I mean, look at how TikTok and Nikita Dump Truck uses the girly aesthetic and label as a way of communicating complicated political economic issues with the whimsy, but it's not just limited to that. It's not as simple as women are reclaiming and redefining girl. Unlike girl dinner, a lot of the girl labels aren't actually affiliated with real girlhood. By that I mean, there's something kind of childlike about eating a bunch of crackers for a meal. It's the kind of thing you would eat when you're a kid and your parents are out. Engaging with that behavior as an adult feels playful. And so there's an argument that girl dinner is girl because it brings out that playfulness. But that's not true for other girl activities. For example, what does girlhood have to do with going on a walk? Look at this recent tweet, for example. Eating my girl dinner, taking my hot girl walk, listening to my sad girl music, reading my feral girl books, going out dancing with my girly honors, getting bevies with my girly pops, every day a slow march towards death womanhood. This joke, which implies that the overuse of girls suggests an inherent fear of womanhood because it's associated with aging and therefore death, struck a chord for a lot of people. Look at this response, for example. This is what gets me. Like, I know, I know it's not that deep, but what am I to do with women my age, not young people, talking about their girl dinners and their sad girl music and girl, girl, girl. The idea of being a woman is just so apparently repulsive to them. Literally, God forbid you eat olives off a plate like an arch and desirable woman on the Riviera. Must we recoil from adulthood? when we are ourselves adults. Repeating myself from down thread, but it's this apparent feeling the perpetuation of girlhood is the only way to stay the protagonist of your own life. Girls are vibrant and alive and full of dynamic spirit. Women aren't main characters. They're not desirable or hungry. Sorry to be a lesbian, but God, free yourself from having your life defined by the stages of usefulness to men. But I don't necessarily agree with this take. I think the use of girl isn't necessarily about the disparagement of womanhood but potentially the feeling of not being worthy of it. Women are adults with their shit together. They're mature, powerful, and a lot of young women, particularly millennial women, don't feel like they can claim that title as their own. And so in this video, we're gonna explore why so many women my age cling to the girl label and the wider questions around what adulthood even is or should be, and more importantly, who has access to it.
What even is being an adult? What does it mean to be an adult? Or I guess I should ask, what does it mean to be an adult of my generation? The millennial generation. Born between 1981 and 1996, millennials are the generation that so many newspaper opinion columnists love to complain about. Now, before we go any further, it is important to note that millennials, like any other generational label, isn't necessarily a useful distinction. There's a whole lot of experiences contained with any age group that make it fairly difficult to form generalizations without also narrowing down like nationality, income, ethnicity, etc. A lot of generalizations around millennials, for example, the often quoted statement that millennials were the first generation to grow up with the internet, ignores the fact that there are huge amounts of millennials around the world who didn't have access to the internet growing up. In fact, generational labels are so contentious that over 150 social scientists wrote a letter to the Pew Data Center asking them to retire the use of generational labels like baby boomers, Gen X, and millennial. The letter pointed out that, among other things, the division between generations is arbitrary and has no scientific basis. With the exception of the baby boom, which was a discrete demographic event, the other generations have been declared and named on an ad hoc basis without empirical or theoretical justification. Pew's own research conclusively showed the majority of Americans cannot identify the generations to which Pew claims they belong. Cohorts should be delineated by empty periods, such as individual years, equal number of years or decades, unless research on a particular topic suggests more meaningful breakdowns. However, within a more narrow lens, for example, focusing on a certain area, it is still useful to study certain age groups. For simplicity, I'm going to continue to refer to people born between these years as simply millennials, but note that almost all of my research focuses on millennials residing in the US and the UK. And when I'm talking about millennials within the context of the research, the research itself referred to them as millennials. And when you look at people my age who grew up in English speaking Western countries, it becomes clear that our adulthood, my adulthood looks very different to the adulthood of say my parents. We're far less likely to hit certain adult milestones within the same timeline that the generation before us did, if at all. On the bright side, millennials as a whole are more educated than previous generations, with over 35% of us in the United States achieving a bachelor's degree or higher. Within that category, female millennials have experienced the biggest increase in education. According to the Pew Research Center, among women of the silent generation, only 11% had attained at least a bachelor's degree when they were young, ages 25 to 37 in 1968. Millennial women are about four times 43% as likely as their silent predecessors to have completed as much education at the same age. So, okay, millennial women, despite our insecurities, are actually the most educated generation of women. And while on average, millennials make less money than the previous generation, the wage gap is decreased significantly over the past few decades. My experience of being an adult woman, it's different from my mother's, not to mention the experiences of my grandmother's, which sounds counterintuitive to some because the transition from child to teen to adult is one that feels a objective and fixed. You're a baby, a toddler, an infant, a child. When you reach the teen numbered years, you become a teenager. And then when you reach 18, you are technically an adult, right? Well, age categories like child and adult ultimately are social constructs. They frequently are informed by biology, but ultimately the behavior or expectations we impose on people of a certain age are cultural rather than objective. In Jewish tradition, for example, a bat or bar mitzvah marks a child's transition into Jewish adulthood, a kind of coming of age specifically associated with being responsible for your own actions. Historically, quinceañera are celebrations of a girl's 15th birthday that also marked her transition to young womanhood and beginning preparations for married life. In Japan, the traditional age of maturity is 20, and that transition to adulthood is still nationally celebrated on coming of age day. Even in recent years, Western social constructs around coming of age have greatly shifted. In fact, the idea of the teenager is less than 100 years old. The word itself dates back to the early 1900s, but it wasn't until the Second World War that it became, you know, a thing. The term caught on in the USA during an R after the Second World War in large part because of three major cultural shifts in education, economics, and technology. Compulsory mainstream education meant that young people were staying in school for longer, increasingly coming together in large high schools rather than the one-room local schoolhouses of the early 20th century. This gave teenagers a place to develop a separate youth culture away from their families. Rapid economic growth meant that more teenagers had their own disposable income for the first time, whether from a part-time job or in the form of an allowance, and didn't necessarily need to contribute to their family's finances. 
And the increased availability of cars also gave teenagers freedom and independence, running parallel to relaxing attitudes to unchaperoned socialization. But the teenager didn't begin life just as a social category. The word caught on because it was useful to one group of people in particular, marketers. The teenager was more than anything else a consumer demographic and an untapped one at that. By the mid 1950s, the word teenager had become internationally popular and teenagehood now feels enshrined in our culture as an important stage of life. But as this history demonstrates, this wasn't always the case. Stages of life are flexible and changing. So is that what's happening with millennials today in regards to adulthood? Adulting. I think the millennial language around being an adult speaks volumes. Just look at the adulting trend. Beginning its usage on social media around 2008, it was shortlisted for the OED's Word of the Year in 2016. Writer Jessica Gross described it as, a term that seems to be wielded most frequently by young women and the pastel bedecked brands wooing them to signify the completion of grown-up tasks like doing laundry, going to work, exercising, and cooking a meal. The term adulting appeared in a few places in the early 21st century before it it really took off in the 2010s. From 2013 onwards, dozens of books have been published aimed at teaching millennials, the generation who were at the time coming of age or in their early 20s and 30s, how to adult. Much like the word teenager, the widespread adoption of adulting came when it became a marketing tool. From books to t-shirts to planners to candles, brands figured out they could target millennials and particularly millennial women with quirky, relatable products. Adulting is a verb, and as such, it isn't something you are, but rather something you do do. It's a task you perform and can therefore fail at. A thing that isn't automatically conferred on you when you reach a certain age. It's something you have to strive to achieve. It's a constant state of doing and there's a perpetual threat that it could be taken away from you. There's this underlying question. Can we adult enough to become an adult as a fixed state? And even if we could, is this a state we can relax into knowing that we've reached it? Adulting is a behavior. It's a kind of fake until you make it external action as opposed to an innate sense of adulthood within yourself. The reasons for the use of the word have many theories around it. Is it born of the particularly millennial sentiment that earnest trying is itself cringe? Or is it that it's been seen to be inappropriate to boast about actual adult achievements? Well, perhaps. One 2014 study by Jesse L. Smith, a professor of psychology at Montana State University, found that women are more likely to be seen as bragging about themselves than men who are seen as confident and capable in the same circumstances. Is adulting meant to be ironic, sarcastic, or self-effacing? In a 2017 article for Elle, Julia Carpenter wrote that, much of the online conversation about adulting involves failing at it. On Instagram, the adulting hashtag, accompanying photos of newly purchased cars or spectacularly healthy grocery hauls isn't nearly as popular as adulting sucks, which boasts more than 17,000 plus posts. But what prompted this? What is it about the modern world that's led people who are biologically and legally adults to this feeling of incompetence? When did adulthood stop being a fixed state you attain when you turn 18 and start being an attempt, a performance, and more often than not, a failure? In a 2018 study, Hashtag Adulting and the Disordered State of American Adulthood, anthropologist Susan Hill studied recent college graduates. She asked herself subjects, all of whom were over the age of 18, whether they considered themselves an adult. Most responded with both yes and no. They identified their age as being technically an age of adulthood, but strongly felt that they didn't have the symbolic experience of adulthood. They lacked money, marriage, children. Without these goalposts, their identity as adults was never solid. Instead, they had moments of adulting, victories like buying a car or chores like heading to the DMV that temporarily grounded them in a sense of maturity. Hill wrote, what the noun adult renders as an essential part of oneself, a robust status or stage that one reaches and holds onto, the verb adulting expresses as situated, contingent, and always in progress. It is a word apt for the state of social adulthood in the US, where a long eroding set of markers from the 20th century are collapsing into a disordered adulthood, fertile with possibility and risk. She continued, the informants dealt particularly with the problem of becoming adults, picking up various cultural detritus along the way, the Ikea Hebb Board, the Fordist family dinner table. The word adulting captures the partial, tactical quality of their labours. It's not simply another self-referential millennial tick, nor is it just one more entry in a long series of noun-turned verbs in the English language. Adulting reflects the fundamental incoherence that greets young people as they make sense of how to reach social maturity in today's world. To adult is not to authoritatively inhabit a life stage or status. It is, however incompletely, however poorly, to behave like an adult in spite of the disorder. 
In other words, the switch of adult from a noun to a verb removed its permanence as an identity. Adulting, or fleeting moments that signify responsibility, is about as mature as millennials could get in a system where they no longer had upward mobility. Still, despite the impossibility of adulthood as an identity, millennials still chased it. In Portland, Maine, there was an actual adulting school where students can soon test for their own adulting quotient, or AQ. The AQ, just like an IQ, is a score measuring just how good you are at life planning, task management, and more. The early 2010s saw a massive wave of adulting books that millennials bought presumably because they wanted to be mature. Books like Almost Adulting, Adulting, How to Be a Grown-Up in 468 Easy-ish Steps, Adulting 101, and Why Didn't They Teach Me This in School? Although there were some instances of excitement around adulting, it soon took on a more bitter tone. Instead of earnest declarations, adulting soon began to signify the growing millennial awareness that they wouldn't have the same life as their parents. Author of the book Almost Adulting, Arden Rose, said, In the years since the word first prominently appeared, it's taken on a new life, part humble brag and part self-deprecation. We're poking holes in the idea Idea that it's a process with an end goal, a dreamy vision of prepared adulthood, always out of reach. You post a photo of a lunar bar captioned balanced dinner hashtag adulting fail to roll your eyes at the idea of ever reaching that picture perfect stage of adulthood promised to us in sponsored content. I think it's interesting that this very specific image of a Lara bar on Instagram that she describes feels extremely close to me to the TikTok concept of a girl dinner. How far is this a social coping mechanism, ascribing a whimsical silliness to failure as opposed to seeing it as a moral failing? Is it just easier to brush off being bad at adulting compared to feeling incapable of being an adult at all? Is this a new phenomenon? It's not clear to what extent the feeling of not quite being a real adult started with millennials, or whether this is an internal crisis that repeats with every new wave of adults. I don't necessarily think that no generations before us doubted their capacity as adults, or thought that they had it all figured out, but I think it spread particularly rapidly amongst millennials because it has this flavour of a lot of online trends where someone says something out loud that they have been thinking that other people want to share because they were thinking it too. When people talk about millennials as a collective, there are some generational experiences that are implied to have had a unique impact on us, particularly 9-11 and the 2008 financial crisis. Rebuttals to this assume that the observation is an attempt at special snowflakeism, to claim that we're particularly affected by global events where generations before us were having a lovely old time. Because, you know, we're aware that there have been financial crashes before and that previous generations lived through wars and poverty and struggle. But I think something interesting about our particular experiences are that being drafted as a teenager into the world wars or to fight in Vietnam is a direct experience of rapid maturation. Millions of young people forced to grow up too soon. After the Second World War with the introduction of the GI Bill in the US, the rush to get these young men into the mold of traditional adulthood was apparent. Benefits included low cost mortgages, low interest loans to start a business or farm, one year of unemployment compensation and dedicated payments of tuition and living expenses to attend high school, college or vocational school. I think when adulthood is defined so often by social markers of financial stability, home ownership, marriage and children, for example, why do generational experiences have less of an effect than economic circumstances and access? specifically a lack of ready access to these milestones, while still being stable enough to have a place to land. Moving back in with your parents, for example, that doesn't force you to grow up in the way that having nowhere to live can. In fact, these markers themselves are reasonably new, looking back through history, particularly women having access to adulthood through economic independence, or ordinary people having the ability to own land of any kind, yet they are impactful to today's perception of adulthood. Are millennials really failing at adulthood? Millennials failing at adulthood is not just a perception based on memes and self-criticism, it's in the data. There are arguably four main markers that constitute traditional adulthood. Housing, finances, marriage and parenthood, and agency. Housing. A room of one's own, a stable place to live, a family home, property. There's a sense that adulthood, true adulthood, is living independently, particularly if this means owning your own home. The mortgage, the white picket fence, the glossy magazines full of ideas for home decor, paint samples, new bathroom tiles. 
But how far is this a realistic dream of adulthood for millennials? Uh, not very, it turns out. According to a 2021 study in the US, millennials had the lowest home ownership rate of any adult generation. Only 43% of millennials were homeowners, well below the average of 65%. It's not just the ability to own your own home in and of itself that conveys adulthood to many. It's also how that changes your experience of your own living space. When you rent, you aren't able to make a place your own. For many, DIY projects are a waste of time and money if you have to repaint the walls and move out in a year or two. Many renters aren't allowed to make these kinds of even superficial changes to their home anyway, even if they wanted to. There's no point investing in furniture that you love if you'll have to abandon it when you move into a different space that you aren't sure that they will fit in. You have to leave it the same way you found it. You can't make a mess because someone else owns the thing that you have to clean up. And it's not just a lack of home ownership. A lot of millennials aren't able to afford to rent either, many continuing to live with their parents or returning to live with them in times of financial difficulty. There's been an almost 15% rise in the number of non-dependent adult children living at home in the past decade. About 30% of 25 to 29 year olds now live with their parents, and more than one in 10 adult children aged 30 to 34 do. The rental generation is keenly aware that they don't own anything, not just in terms of renting a flat, but you know, having to enter into contracts to pay off your phone because you can't afford to pay for a handset in one go, or using Zipcar because you can't afford a vehicle of your own, or any number of closed rental companies because who can afford wardrobe staples made well enough to last decades anymore. Finances. This drop in millennial housing stability is compounded by their economic position. It isn't necessarily that living with parents or perpetual renting is a deliberate choice, but an economic necessity. According to Forbes, 52% of non-homeowning millennials aren't saving for a down payment, and of these, many cite underpaying jobs or joblessness as the reason. So it isn't just that home ownership is becoming a reality for millennials later in their life than the previous generations, because for many, it isn't considered a reality at all. It's not exactly news, but it is worth including that wage stagnation and rising house prices mean that the income levels and therefore purchasing power of the average millennial is much less than it was even a couple of decades ago. According to reporting from the Urban Institute, those earning the medium income in the US or below can only afford 20% of the properties on sale in the US. Compare that to the roughly 50% of homes that they would be able to afford in 2016, and you can see the pattern here. And this is especially impactful to those on minimum wage. According to 2019 research by the Economic Policy Institute, the federal minimum wage was worth 17% less than in 2009 and 31% less than in 1968. If minimum wage had kept pace with productivity since 1968, it would now be $24 an hour instead of $7.25. And we see this across the millennial experience. Hobbies become side hustles, as the need to monetize spare time to keep up with the rising cost of living means salaries aren't enough anymore. People aren't spending their evenings and weekends monetizing their hobbies because they love money, it's because they need it. And hobbies and interests are some of the main skills that they have. We see this phenomenon in condescending reports on millennial spending habits. One article in Forbes scathingly reported, recent survey research from Eventbrite found that millennials are increasingly prioritizing spending on events and ephemeral experiences over tangible assets. Is this refusal to delay gratification yet another sign of a generation that refuses to grow up? I mean, is it that millennials are wasting money on instant gratification and frivolity or trying to claw back some joy from a precarious existence where traditional financial investments and things like property are unavailable to them? One of the participants in Susan Hill's study that I mentioned earlier put it plainly. Marriage, family, house, car, all that stuff takes money. It takes money to even go on a date. I honestly cannot go on a date because I just don't have the money to buy a girl a drink. Marriage and parenthood. Once you've flown the coop, as it were, the next obvious adult milestone is replicating the nuclear family yourself. Commitment, responsibility, long-term romantic relationships, all leading to marriage and child rearing. As a child, looking at your parents, you more than likely had no problem seeing in them that quality of adulthood, not just their age, but their authority. Indeed, Susan Hill's study found that the only informants who seemed to have no qualms about their own social adulthood were the few who had children. Ultimately, parenthood was the feature that could trump money in the hierarchy of maturity. This is especially true traditionally for women, where marriage and motherhood was not just a marker of successful adulthood, but a marker of successful womanhood itself. 
journalist Sarah Hayford investigated the birth rate in the US across the decades and found, after the highs of the baby boom in the mid 20th century and the lows of the baby bust in the 1970s, birth rates were relatively stable for nearly 50 years. But during the Great Recession from 2007 to 2009, birth rates declined sharply and they've kept falling. In 2007, average birth rates were right around two children per woman. By 2021, levels had dropped more than 20%, close to the lowest level in a century. Finances, of course, play into this. Weddings are expensive and children even more so. In America, without access to a nationalized health service, even birth itself can be unaffordable. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, labor costs on average are more than $4,500 per childbirth, even if you're insured. And the price of maternity and newborn surgeries has risen by 60% over the past decade. That's not to mention childcare costs on top of just the fact, you know, humans need to be fed, watered and clothed. One survey of almost 600 millennials found that nearly three in five of those without children said they didn't have any because of their financial situation. This is particularly of concern when it comes to the way women are making reproductive decisions, knowing the realities of attitudes towards working mothers. As Dr. Kate Barn, Director of Labor Market Policy at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth has pointed out, we know that women make fertility decisions based on economic opportunities. If you take two years off to have your child, it's not just two years of lost wages, and women know that. The difficulties of re-entering the workforce after time away is only compounded by prejudiced attitudes to mothers. Research has shown that when women become mothers, they're seen as less common Competent than their male or childless counterparts, even if, you know, nothing else has changed. In terms of marriage, we've seen an even sharper decline. In 2019, figures from the Office of National Statistics in England and Wales showed that only 213,000 heterosexual couples had married that year, down more than 50% since the peak in 1972. The number of 25 to 35 year olds who are unmarried had more than doubled since 1991. Agency. Adulthood is often perceived through the lens of you leaving the nest. When someone goes out into the world and makes a life independent of their parents, no longer living at home, depending on family income or being under their parents' control. Adulthood in this way is marked by a kind of agency and competence that you don't have as a child or teen. You can make your own decisions, create a life for yourself that's built around your own sense of self and your own values. The three previous markers of adulthood I talked about, stable housing outside your family home, healthy finances, marriage and parenthood, they're all linked. They interweave and compound each other. They allow a sense of this adult independence and agency, but once one drops off, the others come tumbling down as well. If you have no stable place to live, no stable income, no stable sense of family, what does a stable sense of adult self look like? For some, there is this kind of hopelessness that comes from acknowledging this difficulty. When you know that you won't have access to these major milestones of adulthood, what is the point of learning how to change the tire of a car that you don't own? When it sees smaller, ultimately insignificant acts of adulthood, like throw pillows or a neatly stocked fridge, is it just easier to not bother? Is it too vulnerable to admit that you failed at adulthood in a traditional sense? When we look at the idea of adulting from this lens, is it any wonder it became a trend? The defeated smile at each other knowing the limits of our realities, trying to make the most of it. Is there a freedom in knowing that you won't be able to attain it and figuring out what your life looks like next once you admit that? What's wrong with us? So it's not just that many millennial women don't feel like adults in some existential psychological way. It's also clear that they aren't hitting traditional markers of adulthood in a very tangible way either. But why is this? I think there are three branches of reasoning behind this. The first simplest answer is one that I hinted at in previous sections. They simply don't have access to traditional adulthood experiences. Whether they're considered adult or not is out of their control. Economic precarity means it's harder to access adult things like a home, marriage, or kids. No longer can one assume that they will have a stable career climbing the corporate ladder at one or two companies all their life. Your job simply isn't safe. I have friends who have been made redundant multiple times in the past few years and upward promotions within companies are not a guarantee at all. Even if economic stability is reached later in life, this may be after women's ability to have their own biological children has passed. Many millennials simply struggle to afford traditional adulthood at all. Even for those that find themselves reaching beyond class barriers with better paid careers than their family before them, the lack of financial literacy built into our education system means growing wealth and securing assets as a practice more widely available to those with family 
family accountants and inheritance and parents who've been paying into savings accounts and investments for them since before they were born. Because I think it's vital to note that these assumed markers of adulthood have not always been equally available, even to previous generations. Home ownership for working class or low income households is a very different undertaking than for those in families who have access to inherited wealth or growing investments. It could be argued, in fact, that this framing of adulthood markers is a particular vision of middle class life itself. Through history, working class children and teenagers were much more likely to enter the workforce earlier and experience adult life in terms of needing to grow up and handle responsibility faster than wealthy peers, regardless of their access to financial stability. Similarly, those of the upper land owning classes were able to exist in a perpetual state of childhood in terms of their lack of day to day responsibility, moving from lavish family home to marital life, where even if they technically had the markers of a home, wealth and marriage and children, they didn't have the experience of self sufficient adulthood being surrounded by inherited money, servants and society. Plus, we can also see how the differences in the experiences of adulthood for most marginalized individuals complicates the traditional ideas of what an adult is from a social standpoint in different ways. Growing up, I was very aware that as a queer woman, it was not legally possible for me to access marriage at all and that parenthood had its own barriers as well. We've historically seen queer people having to lie on mortgage applications about their sexuality, lesbians losing custody of their children when they came out. There were legal constrictions on what was considered family and what was legitimized as such. And so my concept of adulthood was shaped by that. This is something that many queer theories have discussed and a particularly apt area of study here is what's known as queer temporality or queer time theory. It's concerned with how queer people, both as individuals and communities, process and experience time. It's often in opposition to heteronormative understandings of time, including stages of life like adulthood, and is informed by queer history, memory, and identity. We are often forced to grow up faster than our peers in some ways, as we develop a sense of self that has been demonized throughout history at a young age. Yet many of us also miss out on the milestones of teenage life where we are teenagers. First blushes of romance and kisses are either displaced to later on in life or when we're teenagers, we skip forward to more sexual explorations because there is a lack of access to romance in our high school environments. The old adage, you can't be what you can't see is apt here. How can the queer child or adolescent imagine a queer adulthood if they have no models for it? Many British millennials grew up under section 28 where it was literally outlawed to talk about such examples in a school setting. There was no straight linear path forwards into a set model of attainable adulthood for us. Our lifetimes themselves queered around us. This lack of a queer future for many felt like no future at all. From the AIDS crisis to the gay youth suicide epidemic, the supposition of even reaching adulthood was not a given for many. The concept of a second or delayed adolescence is something that many LGBTQ plus people talk about. In the years of early adulthood, many in the community are experiencing the first that their cis and straight peers got to have 10 years prior. Think about the trans metaphor of the cracking egg, a birth that you experience as a teen or adult, a new life starting when you're meant to be settled. This brings us on to the second reason behind millennial women not attaining traditional ideas of adulthood. They simply don't want to. It doesn't have to be a source of lifelong failure, but can instead be that marriage, children, and the kind of self-serious maturity is seen as unwanted or unnecessary. Because adulthood is also attached to a way of acting, a type of constraint which dictates perhaps a conformity to mainstream society. What does fun in adulthood look like? What does freedom, play, carefree life look like? The markers I discussed earlier are often tied with the expectation of maturity that is socially defined and policed. For many people, they just don't find it appealing. For many millennials who saw firsthand the rise of divorce rates through their parents, the heteronormative ideal of a nuclear family doesn't represent a stable refuge any longer. They can see the cracks in the concept of adult life. Marriage becomes something which ties you down as often as it gives you safety and stability. Because in reality, these milestones are arbitrary. There are countless articles and tweets and think pieces of older generations sneering at millennials for not adhering to these milestones in enough time or even at all. But that isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? A decline in birth rates is also indicative of a decline in unwanted pregnancies or unintended births, which seems like a natural consequence of effective birth control and women having more power over their reproductive choices. 
What is seen as adulthood is socially constructed and as such is tied to the values of a society in which it was constructed. We can see this in the way that it maps onto white Western ideals while ignoring the variety of family structures, adult timelines and community networks in other countries and cultures. Where an adult living at home with their parents is often framed as a failure in white British families, it would be the norm in many other parts of the world, including Egypt, India or Hong Kong, where 76% of adults aged 18 to 35 still live with their parents, according to the Urban Research Group at City University. I talked before about queer people not having access to traditional Western adulthood, and the experience of queer life and queer time also leads many queer people to reject the desire for traditional adulthood even if they had access to it. Like many queer experiences that dismantle heteronormativity, there is a joy and freedom for many in being free from the expectations placed on their cishet peers. We have alternative queer milestones to mark the progression of our lives, coming out, transitions, first queer sexual and romantic experiences. Those in the queer community can have the timelines of our experiences muddled. After all, baby queers can be any age, right? There is this beautiful piece by writer Leela called The Pace of Queer Time, where they write, I've been thinking recently that queer time for me is a self-declared snow day, a chance to stay in bed and explore ourselves unhindered by the outside world, a chance to exist, to play, free from the hetero pillars of career, marriage, and lineage, a break from the ticking clock of larger society's notions of progression. And not every queer person take the opportunity to live this snow day life, but queerness opens up these possibilities. As good old Foucault himself said, to be gay, I think, is not to identify with the psychological traits and the visible masks of the homosexual, but to try to define and develop a way of life. It can be a freedom, but also an act of resistance to tradition, to capitalism or tetronormativity, to just live life as you wish as a queer person. Scholar Jack Halberstam's 2005 book, In a Queer Time and Place, argues that queerness itself is an outcome of strange temporalities, imaginative life schedules, and eccentric economic practices. Because in many ways, for many years through history, we were forced out of traditional life. We had to make our own way. For many queer people, there is this experience of a delayed or second adolescence as a radical reclaiming of our childhood and our adult years, to be carefree and to play and to learn and grow and make mistakes and be cared for and held and loved all the same. It's a reliving of a childhood outside of the oppressive judgment of unsupportive families or institutions. It's rejecting the idea that there are things that you are meant to grow out of, that there are interests that are beneath the adult you who should be slotting into line with the rest. This experience of being outside of traditional adult timelines can be seen in other marginalized women's lives too. Black and Latina women have spoken endlessly about the sexualization they so often experience during girlhood, forcing them into bodies perceived as adult before they're ready. The first study that focused on the adultification of black girls by Georgetown Law's Center on Poverty and Inequality found that adults view black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers. This had a knock-on effect that forced black girls to grow up faster than their white peers, including being seen as needing less support, protection, comfort, and nurturing. They were also disciplined more harshly. It can therefore be an empowering experience to reclaim and re-experience a girlhood taken from you. Chelsea from The Financial Diet made a TikTok recently calling in millennials for self-infantilization and saying that instead of embracing this attitude the response should be anger and political agitation. But for many marginalized people, they've tried the anger thing and it has burnt them out and burnt them up. For some, it's enough to just allow yourself to want a different type of adulthood than the one dictated to you. The final branch of reasoning is intimately connected to this. It's those who cannot fully access social adulthood, not because of a lack of tangible resources or for lack of wanting, but because of how others perceive them. The infantilization of disabled women, for example, is a pervasive issue that affects their self-determination, access to medical care, independence, and more. For many disabled women, it isn't just being locked out of some arbitrary adult club, it's a removal of very real power and self-determination. How others perceive you and the decisions they make based on that is often just as out of your control as income or relationship status. The markers of adulthood I mentioned earlier might be social constructs, but that doesn't mean that they aren't real in the minds of those that create and uplift them as part of their worldview. Those that are invested in the idea that being able to attain these things makes you worthy of not just the idea of adulthood, but the respect that goes with it. The same people that make condescending remarks about millennials spending too much on avocado toast and Starbucks. The people who see it as actively bad to not conform to traditional ideas of adulthood, not just because having an unstable living situation is stressful and, and 
an objective way, but because it means that you aren't doing life correctly. It isn't just that not having a successful nuclear family is bad, it's that you are bad for failing to conform to it. In Constructing Adulthood in the Age of Uncertainty, the sociologist Jennifer N. Silver interviewed working class young people in their 20s and 30s to explore how they've redefined adulthood in an era of declining economic opportunity. She found that her interviewees, locked out of traditional models of adulthood, had created ones for themselves, a new form of coming of age based on self-realization gleaned from denouncing a painful past and reconstructing an independent, complete self. They talked about overcoming addiction or working through trauma. They personalized the milestones of adulthood and were thus able to claim the dignity and respect due to adults. While researching for this video, I've seen so much disparagement about millennials, especially women, for not being able to access the expectations of adulthood or talking about that failure publicly or not talking about it enough or talk about it in the wrong ways. I didn't know what side of this discussion I was gonna fall down on. I find myself unable to get riled up about the girlification of everyday experiences by women online. I'm pretty unaffected by the cringe adulting content. I'm okay with with frolicking and whimsy and baby voices. Because looking at this whole discussion, at the recent history of this apparently immutable idea of what an adult should be, it just feels more and more like a path of expectations which are fundamentally inaccessible to so many. I don't think it's useful to let social pressures or corporations define access to your own adulthood. The age of the internet allows younger generations to see this fun, vulnerable, passionate side of the generation above them for perhaps the first time, and absolutely outside of their immediate family or community. I don't think the joys of childhood should be mutually exclusive to a life of an adult. I've seen TikToks from teenagers that talk about how embarrassing and cringe they think it would be to be cosplaying or reading fan fiction or getting excited about a sleepover with your friends when they're 30. And it makes me kind of sad for them because I don't think there's any point in adulthood if it comes at the price of aging out of your interests and hobbies and those wonderful experiences that bring you joy. Because whoever you are, I promise you, your joy matters. We only get one life and I'm sure as hell not gonna waste mine by wondering if my happiness is getting in the way of my adulting. Maybe embracing my inner girl is the most mature thing I can do. So women of the internet, I say we should have our girl dinner and eat it too. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know what you thought in the comments. And if you would like to support my access to adulthood and or girl dinner, uh, I will leave a link to my Patreon in the description uh, so you can support this channel and videos like this one in the future. And also links to my social media so you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye.